you want to get on the action, we want to hear from you. Hit us up, faderoutemail at gmail.com. Slide in our DMs on IG at Fade Route Podcast. Drop us a DM on Twitter at Fade Route DNZ. Comment on our YouTube channel, The Fade Route with DNZ. Questions, comments, picks, segment suggestions, you name it, we want to hear from you. Get at us in crowd. Coming at you from the Hey Yo Studios, it's the Fade Route with DNZ. Here are your hosts, D and Z. Coming at you live from the AO studio. Hey, it's yo. the fade route with D and Z. I am D. Got a great show for you tonight. The NBA is close to a new CBA. LSU women win their first national title in basketball. And the WWE has a buyer. But we begin today's show with the men's NCAA basketball tournament ending on Monday night with UConn beating San Diego State by 17 points. <clears throat> no Kawhi Leonard, no Kemba Walker, but the game was pretty good. You know, at the end of the day, UConn, they were just better than all their opponents in the tournament, beating each team by double digits. So, Z. Do you think the UConn program is now a blue blood program in men's college basketball? It's a, fun, it's a fair question, right? And <clears throat> Jim Calhoun brought them there multiple times. Kevin Ollie got them there. And now Danny Hurley got them there. Like, yeah, they're a blue blooded team. Like, they have pedigree. They certainly had the pedigree of the Final Four teams, right? In this new era of name, image, and likeness rights and transfer portal, we are going to see a leveling of the playing ground. Yeah. Right? We're definitely going to see a leveling of the playing ground. Well, it's leveling, but I guess, I guess, see, with that leveling, does that mean that things like what UConn just did aren't going to happen as often as they did? Like, you know, will this meddling or will this transfer portal hurt teams like Duke, Carolina, Kansas, and Kentucky from repeating and from getting back to the Final Four? Well, no, because what they need to do is adjust, right? Sports are a game of adjustment. So... These are the rules you're now playing in. You can't outspend everybody. You can't do the illegal shit under the table. Now it's all out in the open. So you need to offer bigger. You need to offer better. Clearly, the idea of NBA readiness isn't exactly the sole appeal. You know, it's not the sole appeal anymore. If that's the case, then this would have been a Final Four of Kentucky, Memphis, Duke, and North Carolina. Like, those are blue bloods. Well, Memphis, not so much because the Anthony Hardaway. Not yet, thing, not, but you know, you'd probably not say, yet. like, Kansas, Kentucky, Kansas, you throw Kansas Indiana, UCLA. Indiana fell off. Indiana yeah, did true. definitely fell off. The last 20 after years, Bobby Knight right? and then Coach yeah. Davis. But, um, you know, UConn was there already. You know, that that's the, the thing. Like, People quickly, how quickly we forget, you know, UConn under Calhoun was a constant threat and won multiple national titles. And then once Calhoun left, Kevin Ollie was there and Kevin Ollie won a national title. Yeah. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, having come up in college basketball of the late 1990s, UConn's always been there for me. So for me... UConn has always been a story program because UConn has always been a story program as far as, as long as I've been watching it. So I, I don't think it's really, they'll be there. Was, there. There was they will be pro- there. They were a storied program, but I never thought of them in that air. Like I never thought of them in the Duke 
air. I've never thought of them in the North Carolina air. You know, if anything, I thought of Villanova more of that quality of a program, and they're not, right? I mean, no. you know, UConn has done it through three different coaches, and they produce so many NBA players. That's the key. Yeah. That's the key for me. Villanova has produced, you know, it's produced its fair share. Decent, but if, yeah. Decent. If you just want to look, you know, Ameka Okafor, Kemba Walker, Ray Allen, Ben Rip. Gordon, Rip Hamilton, Danielle Marshall, you know, you can keep going down the line. And I, Kevin Ollie, he played in the league. Sure. So, and then if you want to go to some of the guys that weren't as well known, or guys that didn't get to the level that they should have, like a Charlie Villanueva. Had a couple of solid seasons, but didn't, you know, didn't achieve what people thought he would. Hashim Thabit, he played, he was a bust, but he was there. Karan Butler, like Rudy Gay. Like these are all guys who played, who laced them up in stores, Connecticut. Like that's impressive. And I think you really need to start putting respect on the UConn men's basketball. Like, yeah, we get what Gino has done, right? You, you get, like, Gino is definitely, the UConn women have been the star of the show because of Gino and what they've done. That's fair. But put some respect on UConn. Put some respect on UConn men's basketball. Now, as far as, like, the other guys, right? The San Diego States of the world, the Miamis... Creighton's like will a new crop bubble up next year and I think the answer is yes I yeah. think I think there's always going to be that group of next level teams now the thing about this and where we are right now with the way that the system is set up is that because the, the universities can pay and because they can get these NIL deals, athletes will go anywhere, right? Athletes will go anywhere as long as they're getting paid. They'll go to Syracuse. They'll go to North Dakota State. They'll go to James Madison. They'll go to, you know, Stephen Austin, Stephen F. Austin. They'll go anywhere, provided that the, the deal is lucrative. Except for Arizona. You know what going there. Well, they're going for the party. Arizona is routinely one of the, you know, Arizona, Arizona State are usually in the top in terms of party schools, but the, the playing field is now level. And, you know, the NCAA, if they really want to, if they wanted to, they can regulate this. But I don't know if they want to because it's, yeah, it's, it's a different story, man. It's a different narrative now. Now it's truly anybody can bubble up. It's not the it's not the Kentucky story. It's not the Duke story. It's not the North Carolina. Like this is more exciting. And if you're gonna if this is if this is the box Pandora's box that you're gonna open and then couple it with gambling, shit. There's no yeah. incentive for them. There's no incentive for them not to do. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that for all of the Yahoo tourney tourney brackets that were submitted, only 1.96% of people had UConn winning the championship. That's very interesting. Only 37 people. Only 37 people had the final four right. Yeah. 37. The fact that there were 37 had it right, that's pretty impressive. Uh, I found it. I found it interesting that Mike Wilbon said people don't pay attention to conferences anymore. And I thought that was such like a sheepish thing for him to say. Why? Because none of them are in the Big Ten. Like, the, let's not, let's be real. Some of the best teams that are in the tournament this year came out of the Big East. And as a person who went into a Big East school, I knew that they were from the Big East. Marquette, UConn, Creighton, all represented the Big East well in the tournament this year. You know, I mean, for, but for UConn to, to get there with three different NBA coaches and talent, um, it says a lot. Um, and Hurley said the secret to success this year was having three NBA players surrounded with talent. And yeah, that, that does it for you, right? I think it does. 
Um, but he's a hell of a coach, and it's good for them, good for the program. They're attracting, they're attracting really good basketball players uh, on the East Coast. Yeah, no, they're absolutely they're they're doing what they need to do in order to remain relevant. And now that you have Rick Pitino coming into the Big East. Right now that you have, you're gonna get some competition in the Northeast. So yeah. you're gonna you're gonna want to, you're gonna want to keep yourself relevant because people are gonna start looking at St. John's. People are gonna start looking at Georgetown, and it's Providence. gonna start. It's gonna Providence. It's gonna start turning. <laughs> like things are gonna start turning. So like if I'm UConn, like I need to make sure that I'm staying on the forefront of a young player's mind. And I'm keeping in the tournament because if you want to look at, if we want to compare two programs, UConn and Syracuse, right? Syracuse seemingly is kind of like middle lower, right? They're definitely on the decline, especially now that Bayheim is leaving. Yeah. We don't know what that program is going to become. You don't necessarily want to be in the limbo that Syracuse is about to become. But they were there in that dark time, you know, after Calhoun and then that short period of Kevin Ollie. And UConn knows they don't want to go back there again. Because Definitely once you're irrele- once you're irrelevant, it doesn't matter. Right. And then on the other side, the women's tournament ended with LSU beating Iowa. 102 to 85. Angel Reese trolled Caitlin Clark with some John Cena hand gestures and also pretending to put a ring on her finger when the game was well in hand. Do you have any issue with the lack of sportsmanship from the LSU star? Well, let's look at the underlying issue, right? If Angel Reese and Caitlin Clark were men, not women, this wouldn't be an issue. How no, many you guys? Don't, you don't think so. I don't see. I don't think so. Guys trash talk all the time. Guys taunt each other all the time, and it's not on the college level. Lessons. On the college level, though. On the college level, on the high school level, on the pro level, on in the sandbox, on, in the on the court of you know just in the street. Like if you're playing street ball, <laughs> people talk shit. That's part of the game. Like shit talking is is. You know, it's as a part of the game as a jump shot. So if you're going to play playground basketball all the way up to the professional level, you got to be able to talk shit. You got to be able to take it. Do I personally like it? No. Do I like when I see guys like Draymond Green run their mouth all the fucking time? No. Do I like it when I see Angel Reese chasing Caitlin Clark to do the John Cena and the ring thing? No. <laughs> I know I'm the minority here. I'm the person that this is not for me. Like, I I don't like it in either case. But I can recognize that if these ladies were gentlemen, this would not be an issue. So it's definitely a double standard there. You know, like from a personal standpoint, like I said, I don't like it. I don't like rubbing. We don't need to rub our nose. We don't need to rub our opponent's nose in it when we win. We can celebrate that we won, right? Now, after the game, Angel Reese was talking about how Caitlin Clark disrespected a Louisville player and how she taunted her with the you can't see me and the daring them to take a shot from the three-point line. And, you know, I I get that. I understand where you're coming from. But at the same time, I don't have to like it. And... I don't like it when guys do it. I don't like it when women do it. But if this is the nature of the sport, if this is the nature of sports, I can't be mad at it. I used to be mad at the bat flips. I used to not like bat flips. Now I'm, you know, now I'm numb to bat. Now, flips. now you're doing it when you play with football. Right. And then I, <laughs> right. And then I'll get drilled, and then it'll be, you know, it'll just be like, hey, and then you throw I the bat at the pitcher. Right. <laughs> and then I charge the mound, and then. All is right with the world. But, you know, I see this as a major non-issue. What I'm, what I see more of an issue with is the Twitter. 
my god. <laughs> Sam Acho, Dave Portnoy, Jason Whitlock, I believe, chimed in. Keith Olbermann. So, lots of guys, lots of guys chiming in with their thoughts on what this was and, you know, using the, the word classless and you know, there are some racial dog whistles there, but there's a, there are, there are more sexist dog whistles in my opinion, because yeah, if these were two guys in the men's national title game, you know, they would have been feisty, it would have been feisty competitors, feisty competitors. When Reggie Miller did the choking sign to the Nick fans, right? That was okay. If it was Cheryl Miller, she would have been crucified. Hey, Reggie was just being real. Reggie was being Reggie. Like, Re- Reggie Miller's Reggie Miller. But if Reggie, if that was Cheryl Miller, I guarantee you she would have been like the Dennis Rodman of, of women's basketball. Oof. That's, oof. That's, a, that's a dirty pillow state right there. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm taking a different approach to it because I think Caitlin Clark deserved it. Um, we got to rag on her for a bit. And, you know, I think she's a good player. Uh, I just don't like when people disrespect the game. And I felt like she disrespected the game in the semifinals, you know, uh, when she kind of waved off playing defense on Raven Johnson. I felt like you were disrespecting her. Um, you know, we've seen in the NBA where nobody plays defense on Russell Westbrook if he's beyond the three-point line. Because no one's really worried about Russell Westbrook taking a three-pointer. And I remember back in the day when Ray John Rondo was on the Celtics team, they were like, yeah, we're going to let Rondo shoot anything past the foul line. But no one waved him off. No one was saying, you know, I don't have to guard you or things like that. Like, you can't you can't disrespect the game. Um, and that's how I feel Caitlin Clark was doing with the no, you can't see me gestures and and waving off playing defense on, you know, on the on on Johnson. So I I felt like she got what she deserved in the LSU game. You know, you were going up against a bigger, badder opponent. They were up on you. And this girl who felt the way I did about what you did to Reese Johnson was going to give it right back to you. And you had no answer. You took all your three-pointers and you you played a very individual game. That's another thing I don't like about her game. It's it, you know, she scores or assists on a lot of, you know, a lot of, you know, the the, the playing. But you want to see a person elevate your team, you know, and, and, and bring it to new levels. I think she's a good player. I just, I didn't care for her attitude. And uh, <coughs> the only problem I had. Now, how much what, of that is, how much of that is the ESPN narrative, though? Because they were pumping her up so much. Rightfully so. I, I, I don't think they were pumping her up as, as they were just being real because even the coach on LSU gave her a lot of credit after the game because she is a very good player. I'm not, I'm not taking anything away from her talent, but be gracious and be respectful of your opponent. The only problem I have with Angel Reese is that she did it at the end of the game. Like, if you're going to come at her, come at her when it's tied. Come at her when you're winning, when you're losing, you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> the thing Michael Jordan used to say, it's like, you know, everyone likes to talk shit when they're winning. But talk shit when the game's tied. Talk shit when you're losing. Let's Be Patrick see, Beverly. Let, let's, see, let's see what you got then. So that's the only problem I had. But, you know, the WNBA and even – you know, women's college basketball, they have a chance to play this up. You have an opportunity for this to be like a bird versus magic type rivalry because a lot of people tuned in to that national championship game between LSU and Iowa. And a lot of people are going to be all eyes on these two stars. Like, I feel like college, women's college basketball has some stars right now and they need to play to those strengths. They absolutely do. This is an opportunity to grow the game. Right, and because who's the other girl with? I think the girl with Connecticut is Beckers. Paige Beckers, yes. Yeah, she's really good. 
the women's national championship game outrated several, you know, the Grammys, many, many large scale events that a lot of people tune into. The women's national championship game outdid them in the rating. So there's an opportunity here. There's definitely an opportunity here. And it is a huge misstep if the WNBA and college ba- women's college basketball doesn't take advantage of this. You know, especially since you want to keep your players here, right? You want to grow the game here. That should be the goal. You want to aspire young American girls to play with your with your style of play. So this is something that you should, you know, be promoting, but it's hard to promote, you know, it's hard to promote something like that. You know, egomaniacal, selfish play, and then you have poor sportsmanship. Now, yeah. poor sportsmanship, you know, the poor, again, the sportsmanship argument, like that, you know, that ship has sailed. Sports, you know, the days of Barry Sanders giving the ball to the ref after scoring a touchdown are over. And, you know, I don't want, I'm not going to be the old man yelling at the cloud. I admit, (laughs) I admit it that maybe my views are a little passe in that, in that uh, idea. But, you know, you definitely need to know where the line is and you need to, you know, you need to figure out where that is because you know, the other thing on Twitter was when she, when Angel Reese is a pro, is she still going to do this? You have half of the people saying, fuck no, she shouldn't. And then you have the other people saying she absolutely needs to stay true to herself. So, you know, this was very much the same way like Shikari Richardson. Shikari Richardson, when, you know, she was left out of the Olympics because of the failed drug test, you know? It was like, I'm going to be true to myself or it, 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 it becomes a much bigger issue. And I think that, you know, it's something that needs to be dealt with as on a social level, because we're peeling back these layers and we're just exposing more and more. Avoid messy accidents. Get better stopping power with your brake pads. Callahan brake pads. You never know when you'll be driving in the road and there will be a truck tire that you need to avoid and save your family. Callahan Auto. We really care about what's under your hood. Well, sticking with basketball, the NBA and the Players Union appear to have agreed upon a CBA. Players need to play 65 games to be eligible for season awards one and done stays in place and there will be an in-season tournament of some sorts what are your thoughts on the proposed new CBA question if the in-season tournament counts towards regular season standings isn't that just the regular season yeah I don't I don't really get it Adam Silver and why everybody likes him. I don't really get it. It's the, I, I'm confused by that. I, I, don't, I don't understand that. Now, okay, they're, they're reworking some salary things, right? They're reworking the way contracts are constructed, but the, sa- the playing game is weird. I do like the eligibility requirements for postseason awards. But is that going to curb load management? Right. That's the thing. Is, is it that, though? No, I don't think so. That's exactly what I was going to say. Is like, I don't, I don't think you've addressed the main problem in that players aren't playing the games. <laughs> I, I have to admit though, you're right though. The contract thing and uh, the, the 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 salary cap and the luxury tax, I they're trying to incentivize teams keeping their players and developing their players and not really giving it a chance for you know free agents to go to big markets or to form super teams which is cool i'm okay with that um but you gotta get you 
got to figure out how to get your players to play games. You know, it's it, we've talked. I've talked about it on this show a bunch of times. Like, I have zero confidence in going to another town or a city to see a basketball game because I don't know who's going to play in the game. I think, you know, there's three games left in the season or four games left in the season. Neil and Jer- Jalen Brunson's not going to pay in any of the games because he's got some kind of hand issue. It's just like, he's one of the Knicks' best players. What's incentivizing me to go to one of the last three games when they've already clinched a playoff spot? Like, why am I going to go to a game now? And maybe this was my chance to go see him play because I could probably get a ticket. Now, why would I? Well, I think you also need to make a distinction between... You need to make a distinction between legitimate injury, right? Jalen Brunson is legitimately injured. Is he, though? Is he, though? Is Ben Simmons legitimately injured? Like, really? Ben Ben Simmons... the, The Ben Simmons issue is between his ears. So I would argue he is. I would argue he is. Now maybe that's something that, maybe that's something that's en- that NBA needs to take from Major League Baseball and actually have an injured list, or have, uh, you know, take it from the, you know, take the scale from the NFL, probable, doubtful, out. Like maybe that's something that needs to happen in order to, you know, coax fans into coming out to see the team, even though the that player isn't there now load management is a different story right because they're not injured like they they don't have a reason they don't have a physical ailment that's keeping them from playing right you know if it's the back-to-back if it's the the second leg of a back-to-back you know there's no there's no legitimate injury reason there. you're just going to chalk it up to load management now the nba and what spineless Adam Silver is never going to do is hammer down on teams that manipulate back to backs. Yeah. Like, because this isn't, this doesn't do it. Like, I don't, unless it's written into their contract, I doubt players really care about being on the all NBA team. Unless it's an incentive in their contract. And a lot of players, like, 65 games. I mean, I'm pretty sure a lot of players know that they're not going to win MVP. Yeah, so. right. Yeah, like the only thing, the only, the only players you affect with that are people that have like certain milestones in their contract that if they, you know, if they hit it, they get bonuses. Like, oh, if you're, you know, voted for MVP, or you, you know, you win sixth man or things like that. Right. But you know, for MVP award. You're targeting the tippy top of the league, right? You're top. You're targeting Giannis, who plays almost every game. You you're targeting Jokic, who plays almost every game, and Joel Embiid. He seems to have gotten over the injury bug, so he played. Who yeah. is this going after? Who, <laughs> who is this going? It's not going after Kyrie Irving, right? He's not going to be on that level, like. How do you get those guys? How do you get them to play? Kyrie, you know, I don't know, the difference between like a Kyrie and a Kawhi Leonard. Kawhi Leonard was recovering from surgery. And the weird, and the other part is, is like, especially with this new CBA, is like the owners and the players are pretty much 50 50 partners now. Mm-hmm. And now with the, this new CBA proposal, they're going to get more revenue from merchandise and from marketing. So it's like you're making money hand over fist. So. So what is this really about? And, you know, at the end of the day, it comes down to something nobody wants to do. And I've said it a long time. you got to reduce the number of games they play. Especially if you're going to put in this season, this in-season tournament, whatever you're planning to do. Reduce the season by 13 games. Like, make the games more valuable. Now, as far as back-to-backs, I don't, I don't really know. I mean, it's a basketball game. Right. So, instead of... You know, having a person sit out entirely, what would be their hurt and like limiting their minutes maybe in a game? I mean, is that so bad that instead of playing, you know, 30 minutes, maybe you play 15 or 20? Or is that just not possible? Are you, you know, are you worried about getting killed from the media because you didn't play Kevin Durant in the last four minutes of the game? Like, I don't, I don't really know. I don't know what the answer is, but 
this CBA did not address the biggest problem the NBA has. But I, I do find it interesting, though, that, you know, even if you, in the back-to-back and Z, thing. And Z, and Z, just to say, guys are getting paid, man. Yeah. Like, guys are getting 60, 70, 80 million dollar contracts. And these are just B-level players. Yeah. The money's out of control. The money is dead. But sports contracts are out of control. They're in line. Unfortunately, like, they're in line. So, you know, the only sport that doesn't really get paid on that level is hockey. So Those guys play the hardest. Right. <laughs> but, but what I find interesting is that, like you said, back-to-back, every team fears what happened to Kevin Durant, right? Oh, we're going to limit his minutes. You know, you just go out, warm up, take a layup. Oh, shit. <laughs> my leg, that, my leg. My leg, right. oh, my leg. Right. I understand why why teams deactivate their star players because they don't want anything to happen. You're gonna put them in bubble wrap. I understand, but you're doing your fans a disservice. So there's got to be a fine line somewhere that you know, you know. It's kind of like the Jason Kidd pulls Luka Doncic aside and said, "Hey." Take it easy. Take a couple of jump shots and sit on the bench. Yeah. Like we're gonna yeah. dress you. We're gonna dress you, but we're got, we're not gonna play you unless like half the team gets injured. Right. We're gonna play you five minutes a quarter. Like is that that's so it. bad? Is that bad? Is no. that bad? Uh, that's I what... don't think so at all. Uh, whatever. But uh, but there's another there's another thing we haven't touched on yet. The designation of supermax contracts. Now teams like there are there were restrictions. Right? There were only two Supermax contracts per team. Now they've eliminated that. So you may not be able to do it by free agency, but you can do it by trade. So that might be that might be something that we're looking for. Maybe it's not the free agent super teams that we need to be looking for, but we also need to be looking for the trade super teams, like what happened with the Phoenix Suns. That might be the new way to go, trading assets for the superstar player in order to build that super team. So that's something we need to be on the lookout for. Step outside of your safe area and make a statement without saying much with FCK Clout Lifestyle Apparel. Embrace the colorful chaos and stay emotionally regulated in their hoodies, snapbacks, graphic tees, accessories, and more. Season 3 merch is up now. Get it while you can. Go to fckclout.com and get all of your needs from men and women. That's fckclout.com. And speaking of on the lookout, I don't know if you guys saw it, but WrestleMania has come and gone. The Raw after WrestleMania has come and gone. We don't really touch on professional wrestling and sports entertainment on this show like we should. We both grew up with wrestling fans, but this is a pretty big deal from an entertainment standpoint. Vince McMahon found the perfect sale partner to solidify his return to power to World Wrestling Entertainment. The Endeavor Group, which owns the UFC. So it is essentially the parent company of UFC. Bought WWE and is now planning on merging the two organizations under the publicly traded TKO. So if you see TKO in your stock sheets, ladies and gentlemen. That is the new UFC WWE merger. And it only cost them $9.3 billion. You know, it's uh, couch cushion money. Is this a big deal, little deal, or no deal at all? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think think it's a big deal. Um, I think it's an enormous deal. Um, I thought a media company would come in to buy the WWE. That's what I really thought was going to happen. I thought it, I thought Comcast or somebody, or even Disney, <clears throat> really thought they were going to come in and make a, a lucrative offer. <clears throat> but this makes sense, right? Because what's going to happen 
I don't think you're going to get a, you know, Brock Lesnar against John Jones. I don't think that's going to happen. But what I do think is going to happen is there's going to be, they're going to try to secure a TV deal. And, and the TV deal will be a lot more money because now it's WWE and UFC. And I think a lot of the mar- there's going to be a lot of cross marketing going on. So you're going to see Triple H, you know, promoting UFC on his Twitter feed. You're going to see John Jones going to WrestleMania and other pay per view events. I think that's where it's going to really, you know, make it make a big splash. And I also think the merger is going to help. The WWE cut costs. I would assume there's going to be mass layoffs corporate because you just you're not going to need all the double work anymore. And I wouldn't be surprised if within the next five years that they go after boxing. That way they have all of the bases covered from a physical sports and entertainment. You know, and I, I think that would be the next thing that they go and capture and. Listen, I've always said this, you know, I, I, Dana White is in the money business, He's not in the UFC business. He's in the money business. The dude knows how to make money. And, you know, it, I think his role in this is going to be is going to be significant. And I think they're heading in the right direction. So Dana White is going to uh, maintain his role as the head of UFC. Yeah. Vince McMahon is going to still be in charge of WWE. The leader of the Endeavor group has already said all of the final business decisions go through White and McMahon, respectively. Nick Khan is staying on as president of WWE. And last year, or two years ago, when you start seeing these massive talent roster cuts and then you start seeing backstage cuts, writers, you're trying to make the books look good. Right? And, and you the start other thing to... is, is like Ari Emanuel is going to be the Endeavor CEO and he'll oversee yes. it all. <clears throat> so Vince McMahon is going to have a boss. So this is going to yeah. be very interesting for me. I, I want to see that. I want to see how Vince McMahon deals with having a boss instead of being the boss. You know, Dana White has dealt with the Fertitas for years, right? He's dealt with Ari Emanuel. Like he, Dana White has never been the owner of UFC. Like he's always had a boss. Vince McMahon, very interesting to see. The moment things don't go his way, does he pack up and go home? I definitely want to see that. But from a corporate standpoint, WWE has been readying for this moment for the past two years, and they finally seem to have pulled the trigger on the deal that does that makes the most sense for them. But they are being investigated because shareholders, right? 49% of the shareholders are retaining their stake, but are they getting the fair market value? Endeavor's holding a 51% controlling interest and existing WWE shareholders hold the 49% interest. But did they get a fair and reasonable price? So we're going to see what's happening there. But putting the business aspect aside, like that's a huge deal. $9.3 billion is a huge deal. From a presentation, production, product standpoint, it's also a big deal. It's also a big deal because then you're going to have that corporate synergy. Like you said, you're going to see Seamus and Conor McGregor just palling around and, you know, cross promoting an event. You're going to see, you know, Brock Lesnar and Daniel Cormier just shumming it up with, you know, with John Jones. Like Ronda Rousey and Shayna Baszler are former UFC competitors. They won the women's tag match at WrestleMania. Who's to say they don't end up in the crowd at the UFC event this Saturday? Right? It's it's all about eyeballs. It's all about eyeballs. And both organizations are very good at getting eyebrows on, uh, eyeballs on their product. Um, like you said, there's major redundancy now. Both organizations do video production very well. They do video packaging very well. They do broadcasting very well. 
who stays, who goes. Because you don't need you don't need the redundancy on that end. If you're looking to have a healthy bottom line, some of these guys are probably going to end up on the chopping block. And that's completely understandable. But that was going to happen anyway. Because if you went to a, a media company like you suggested, Comcast, they're in the media business. They have production people. NBC Universal, they have production people. But, and they already had a working relationship with WWE because of the Peacock gap. <laughs> and then NB, and then Disney. You can't tell you can't tell me that creators of the Marvel of the the MCU can't do video production. So like everybody like everybody is very good at what they do. But some people are gonna lose their jobs over it. But you know, that's that's the unfortunate aspect of this. From the creative aspect, Vince McMahon got paid. He doesn't need to take any risk anymore. From a creative standpoint, $9.3 million, as long as you keep the boss happy, he doesn't have to do a thing, right? He can just keep trotting out the same guys until they don't want to do it anymore. The John Cena's, the Roman Reigns's, you know, Edge came back two years ago. If Edge wants to stay, as long as Edge wants to stay, he can stay. Brock Lesnar will be champion again. <laughs> there's there's no reason. There's, there's no reason for Vince McMahon to try something new now. He got $9.3 billion. He doesn't need to say, hey, let me take a chance on that Cody Rhodes kid. Let me take a chance on Braun Breaker. Let me take a chance on Austin Theory. Like, you... He doesn't need to. He's not competing against anybody. He won. Yeah, he, won. he hasn't been competing against anybody for years. It was all about getting to this point. And, you know, hats off to him. He's uh, an amazing businessman. I believe he bought the WWF for $1 million back in the 80s. And turned and it into $9.3 billion. Pretty, and two failed uh, football leagues after that and still chucking. So hats off to him. Are you in need of air care maintenance or service? I have the company for you. Air Care Technicians. They service the Westchester and Northern Bronx area and can help you with all your heating and cooling maintenance and service needs. Just give them a call at 914-315-1547. Again, that's 914-315-1547. Or shoot them an email at aircaretechnicians at gmail.com. These guys are the real deal as they are veteran owned, licensed, and insured. Make sure to tell them that DNZ sent you. But, um, ah, the creme to the creme of the show. We are six days into the Major League Baseball season. And even though it's early, what do you like? What do you dislike? And who? is as advertised well like we're going to talk about the pitch clock later so I'm going to leave my thoughts about the pitch clock later I'm going to it's a little teaser ladies and gentlemen that's what we call a teaser but I am surprised that Brian Reynolds is at the top of the league in homers you know Joey Gallo is up there Joey so, Gallo playing jo- well Joey Gallo is playing well like Brian Anderson cut by the Marlins thriving in Milwaukee now, yes, it is six games, seven games, but it's something to note. Luis Arias can hit in both leagues. <laughs> that guy is a sing- that guy. Is- he's a hit machine. Um, a lot of guys are doing what they, you know, are what we expect of them. Garrett Cole off to a hot start. Degrom off to a hot start. Otani, despite what happened opening day. Hot start. As far as teams go, I'm surprised at how slowly the Phillies got off. Oh, yeah. They're lo- I mean, we had no we had no expectations for the Rangers. Not and good. they're drubbing them. They're, they're kicking they're their shit out of the Phillies. They're scoring a lot of they're, runs. They are beating down the Phillies. And then you know, you expect them to be more competitive with the Yankees. I didn't expect the Cardinals to start off as slow as they did. 
The Mets are already beleaguered by injuries. They're already, but you know what? Is it better to get this out of the way now so that you're peaking at the right time? I don't know. Are you getting you it out of the way now? You don't want to get buried early. Or are you don't you start... want to get buried early. Yeah, but uh, are you getting it out of the way now? Or are you setting the standard for what this year is going to be? That's the whole thing. It's like... Well, <clears throat> it's about the expectation, right? A team like the Royals, they're one and four on the season, right? They're burying themselves now. They're not talented enough. Like, nobody expected anything out of the Royals. I, you know, the Mets, they have professional players. They have pitching. Yes, Verlander is out right now there, but the injury bug is there. I think once the ship, real- once, once you get these guys back and back into form, you hope that you're able to right the ship. Now, I as far be, as... I think you have to be very concerned with DeGrom. I mean, not DeGrom, with Scherzer. The velocity is dipping, and he's giving up homers at a really bad clip. Same with Carrasco. Can't be but, losing um, opening day to the Marlins, man. Yeah, Can't be well, giving I mean, up three runs and getting banged around by the Marlins. What's more concerning to me is the homers. The homers are really concerning. But you know, you, you go through memes. you go through these. There are some times that you can't. No matter what you do, you can't keep the ball in the ballpark. Like that that happens. But you're not being, but you're not facing a talent right now, man. You're facing the Marlins and the Brewers, man. What about when you're facing the Cardinals, the Braves, and the and well and the Phillies? <laughs> those, I'm not those scared boys of Phillies. bang those boys bang the ball, man. You're not scared of the Phillies? Not scared of the Phillies. <laughs> not not scared of the Phillies. Sorry. Right? I'm not. I, the Brewers are hot right now. I'm not scared of the Brewers. Sure, because they're playing you. Fucking nine, nine nothing. Wasn't one game nine nothing or ten nothing? It was ten nothing then nine nothing. <laughs> Those are two separate games. <laughs> yeah, and I'm still not scared of the Brewers. No, nobody is. Yeah, no. Like what's concerning is that the Cardinals are two and four. And did you see this thing about Ali Marmo calling out Tyler O'Neill for not hustling? No. Hmm. Yeah, so that's something. He's asserting his authority as manager. Go get but it. But that definitely, that speaks to something. You know, that speaks to something a little bit different. That definitely speaks to something that's happening. And I, I'm not sure, you know, I, I'm not sure if it's necessarily a good thing. Players don't really respond well. Like, <laughs> these players don't respond well to that. No. Like, and O'Neill's response said it all. I play my ass off. I hustle all the time. Well, you didn't. If you did, <laughs> you, your coach wouldn't be yelling at you. But in terms of pleasant surprises, the Rangers are four and two. The Angels are four and two. The Guardians are five and two, and the Rays are six and up. I mean, <laughs> you know, love it. How can you not love baseball? How can you not love baseball? Uh, yeah, I mean, for me, the, the Rangers are the surprise, but good for them. I mean, they spent enough money this this off season right. and last off season, so I'm glad it's paying off for them. I'm surprised the Mariners. I thought they were gonna come out banging, and they're just looking like meh right now. Um, I'm really surprised at the Phillies, man. Like, wow, one in five. Ah, jeez, like, what the. Uh, yeah, I guess you could save the pitch clock for later. Um, uh, the the rising thing, stolen bases. I, yeah, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. And we'll talk <laughs> about that. I'll talk about why that's happening. Um, the Angels. Very, very, very good for them. Very good for them. They're, they're, they're still in it. <laughs> uh after six games, they're still in it. They're yeah. still in it, man. They're still in yeah. it. So yeah, I mean, all in all, it's it's been a all in all. I think it's been a good start. Um, and yeah, we'll see where we go from here. I'm happy with the Braves. They look good. They're playing really well. Um, and just not happy with Freed getting hurt. How do you pull your hamstring in the first game, covering first base? Like, dude, what are you doing? Were you not in spring training camp? Like what? Injuries can happen anytime. You know that. Apparently. Yeah, I mean, Apparently. Look, look at what happened 
to Gavin Lux. He was fielding a ground ball, blew his knee out. Malik, Malik. Coach, Malik don't work. Malik. What about the Pirates at 4-2? Let's go. A very go. surprising, another surprising one. Brian Hayes is on my fantasy team. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> of course he is. Oh my goodness! But you know, it, it's you know, it's very interesting that there's a lot of parity right now. There are no, there are a few juggernauts, right? You got your Braves, you got your Brewers, you got Austin your Rays. Riley is crushing the ball, man. But a lot in the middle, right? You have a lot in the middle, and then only a very few, only a very few are truly awful. <laughs> so putrid. Right, right now. Law of averages will dictate that the cream will rise to the top. The people in the middle will be firmly in the middle. And the guys that are, you know, already playing for next year, that, that'll that be done by Memorial Day. <laughs> I mean, by the quarter pole of the season, we'll know. But we do have a few pleasant surprises. And frankly, like, I'm not concerned for the Astros, for example. They're three and four. I'm not concerned. Yeah. They'll be there at the end. Yeah. I know they'll be there at the end. Like, I can trust that they'll be there at the end. I feel like I, I, that the Blue Jays have earned that same trust. You know? The Mets Springer, have earned that. Springer's from, on fire. <clears throat> Alley Springer is playing out of his mind. You know? The Cardinals will write the ship. I think the Cubs will write the ship. The Mets will write the ship. And then, you know, the Padres are at 500. They'll rise. Baseball, <clears throat> baseball will balance itself out because it always seems to. Like very rarely do you get, you, you get flashes in the pan, but normally they don't have the staying power. The one team that was a flash in the pan that actually went all the way was the 2005 White Sox. I would say that, like they really came out of nowhere and sustained it. But we're gonna see, but. It's definitely a good start to the season, and it's promising. Let's see what happens as we move forward. Do you love brownies? Of course you love brownies. But you know what's better than a brownie? A delicious, handcrafted, gourmet brownie delivered right to your doorstep. That's what our guys at Sweet Life Brownie Co. offer. Chef Tommy D and the crew offer a dozen delicious delights that you will crave. From the classic OB to Dutch Apple to Campfire S'mores and many more. Check out their website, SweetLifeBrownieCo.com, for their Friday brownie drops. At noon, their site goes live and you see what they're making. Since you're there, become a site member and earn points. You earn 50 points just by signing up. Make sure you follow them on Instagram and Facebook too at Sweet Life Brownie underscore co for the latest updates and their latest releases and creations. That's SweetLifeBrownieCo.com. Give them a call, 845-641-3043 and tell them D&Z sent you. That's SweetLifeBrownieCo.com, 845-641-3043. Sweet Life Brownie Co. Because there's always room for a brownie. The choice is yours. Swipe left or swipe right. All right, my online dating fans, you know how this goes. If you like it, you're swiping right. If you don't like it, you are swiping left. And get that shit out of here. Swipe left or swipe right number one. Carson Re- Carson Wentz. During the 2023 season. Yeah, I'm swiping left on this guy. I, I, it's, it's terrible. But the, the best spot for him to go was Denver. And they mm-hmm. wanted up taking the kid, Jared Stidham, from the Raiders. Like, you know, I heard something interesting about Carson Wentz. In his whole, like, time in school for, like, you know, kindergarten through being in college. He never got less than an A on a test. That was an interesting wow. stat. But he, he just hasn't rebounded. He just hasn't rebounded. He hasn't been the same player since the injury. 
I think he's walking into like Joe Flacco, Andrew Dalton territory. So I, 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 the fact that he doesn't have a job right now, that's a little concerning. The only, I would hold out hope that maybe the Chiefs sign him. That would be good for him, but I, I think he, I don't think he, I think his starting days are over. That's very interesting that you mentioned he never got below an A on a test. So what you're saying to me is that like now, this is what I hear. He's 30 years old, and he's never faced adversity before in his life. Exactly. Right. And right. how is he handling adversity? Can't. But statistically, not well. Right. Exactly. Statistically, not well. So I have to swipe left on him as well, as talented as he may be. Yeah. And he is very talented. Right? Like, when he was injured, he was a candidate for the MVP. Right? He had the Eagles primed and ready to go to the playoffs, and Nick Foles took them the rest of the way. Dude, but, in the history of the NFL, there's only been two quarterbacks that had 30-plus touchdowns and under 10 interceptions in their second year in the pros. And those two players are Carson Wentz and Lamar Jackson. Hmm. Wow. Hmm. And those two quarterbacks are viewed extremely differently. Yep. So, and wouldn't it be something if Carson Wentz ended up the backup wherever Lamar ends up? Hmm. Now, that would be something very interesting, but the Ravens, I know the Ravens have Huntley on the roster, but that's about it. You know, the scuttlebutt is that they're considering taking a first-round quarterback. Yeah, but that's it. And you take a flyer on Carson Wentz and see what you can get out of him. You know, he would be fine to have in camp competing for a spot. I'm sure there's going to be, you know, if Gardner Minshew can get a job, you know, why not Carson Wentz? You, you have plenty of talent out there who are cuspy, right? You have guys just good enough to make a roster, just good enough to carry a clipboard. At this point in time, Carson Wentz is that guy. Like, Carson Wentz is less stable than Sam Darnold. And Sam Darnold just got a got a deal with the Niners. So he'll latch on someplace. But in terms of playing time, swipe left. Big time. Swipe left, swipe right. Number two, both the LSU and Iowa women's basketball team getting invited to the White House. Yeah, this comes up because Joe Biden is thinking about having both teams come instead of just having the national champion come. You know, it's tough. I've gone back and forth on this. I'm going to swipe right on this. And here's the reason. I think, regardless of who the president is, whether you like him or not, I think it's a complete honor to go to the White House and meet the president of the United States. Now, in men's sports, I mean, there's a chance that there's a larger number of guys that are going to go on to play in professional leagues and, and have an opportunity to make their, their way to the White House at some point, right? And I don't feel like that same opportunity lies in the women's sport. I don't, you know, I think there's a, a smaller number of women going to the WNBA. And there's an even smaller number that are actually going to get a chance to go to the White House to meet the president and meet the first lady. So since these two teams are college teams, these are college students, I really think it's a great opportunity to go to the White House and meet the president and be honored. You know, but the only thing I would say is, is that I would I would say that then that should take place maybe before the game. Instead of after the game, having those two teams come after the game might be a problem. I'm going to swipe left on it. It's kind of a passe idea to begin with, to have the champion of a league or champion of, in this case, the NCAA tournament, go visit the White House for a photo op. Especially in recent years where the political divide is just getting wider and wider and wider and players and teams are making conscious decisions to avoid such situations I don't it's not even worth it at this point 
it, it really isn't worth it. Just, you know, do something else. Like, if you want to have a phone call with the president, whatever, that's fine. You want to FaceTime with the with the president, do do that. You know, you don't you don't need to charter a plane. You don't need to get all these people into the same room to stand there and take a photo that nobody's ever going to look at again. But it's just a passe. <clears throat> It's a passe idea, and it's, you know, the idea of having the runner up there, too, kind of cheapens it, right? Because it used to be just for the champions, right? right? It used to be kind of like a privilege. No, it's great. Right? It's uh, a perk. It's great. Yeah. 100%. It's a perk. Yeah, you get to have a catered lunch, and you get to hang out with the president, but you had to, you won to get there, like... Why is the second place team getting the same perks of the winner? That doesn't make sense. So, I don't know. I think it's something that needs to be revisited and it will, I think it will something, it'll be something that uh, eventually fades away into the, uh, the bygone era. Swipe left or swipe right. Number three, the new pitch clock. So far. God, I hate it. <laughs> Swiping left. Like, it is... It First of all, first of all, if you're a base runner, it gives you all such an advantage. Because you can see the clock winding down in when the pitcher has to deliver the baseball. And if you time it just right, you can go. And then the other part I don't like about it is, there were, I forget what game I was watching, but the the runner had timed it perfectly and and pretty much took off and then the catcher called timeout and the, the umpire honored the timeout it's like well wait a minute what are you talk how could you call timeout when he took off from first base already like what are you talking about right now so right. i think it, it poses it po- it gives the Believe it or not, it, it gives both sides an advantage in different ways, depending on how you're playing the cards. And uh, I, I don't like it at all. So, I'm swiping left on this, but you have to take into account multiple things at once. There are three new changes, right? There are three new changes that we need to worry about. The pitch clock, the defensive shift ban. And the bigger bases. They're all kind of playing into each other. The people who care about pace of the game and time of the game, why are you going to a baseball game? It's averaging two hours and 38 minutes. Fans of baseball aren't looking at the clock and saying, fuck, this is really long. <laughs> People that are invested in the game are invested in the game. I understand that you're trying to grow the game. I get that. The idea is not lost on me. But there are ways to do it without bastardizing the game. And I feel like the pitch clock is a bastardization of the game. Limit the number of times that hitters can step out. Okay. Sure. Limit the limit the disengagement from the the rubber. Perfect. Love it. Can only throw over to first base twice. Fine. Okay. Clock isn't necessary. Right? You eliminate the shit like what Nomar Garcia Power used to do when he had that routine with his tapping and readjusting of his batting gloves. Or Adam Adovino who has to pace around the mound after every pitch trying to figure out how he can give up another walk off fuck a fucking home run. Like thanks Otto. Oh, nice shit. going, jackass. So yes. The games went from three oh eight last year to two thirty eight so far. Defensive shifts have done what they what they were expected to do. Batting average has gone up. It's helped uh That's- it's helped your your boy Gallo. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, he's hitting them over everybody. Like, he's actually, he's hitting them over everybody this year. Something he could not do in the smaller ballpark. Weird, huh? So, there's that. And then, 
it's just very complex. Like, why must batters be in the box and alert eight seconds with eight seconds left on the clock? Right? Let's compare this to a shot clock in basketball. Can you shoot after eight seconds? You can take it all the way down to one and shoot. How about a play clock in the NFL? You can take it all the way down to one. Why the arbitrary number of eight? (laughs) Eight seems weird. Like, okay. Like, why eight? Somebody explain it to me like I'm a third grader. Why eight? You can still call time out before eight seconds. Oh, seven seconds. Seven seconds. Nope, 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 nope. And... That's why Tim Anderson got run. That's why Manny Machado got run. Yes, they were in the wrong, but why is it seven seconds? Somebody explain this to me. The two disengagements I like. The third pickoff attempt, it's a balk. It's considered a balk. That's nice. I'll take it. But, I don't know. I have a bad feeling that at some point you're going to have like the bottom of the ninth inning two outs, two strikes the tying runs on second base and the hitter's going to get called out on a on a pitch clock violation and that'll, that'll end the game I think that we really need to start thinking about this logically. And my fiance had a great idea. And I credit you, baby. That's a great idea. Treat a two strike pitch clock violation like a foul ball. That you can't be you can't be struck out on that. I think that's a good modification. Cause you're gonna piss off a lot of guys. You're bound to piss off a lot of players if you keep going down this way and you could be potentially impacting games so major swipe left on this one you can't help but smile when you see a balloon the simplest occasion is a party westchester pop stars located in new rochelle new york offers balloon styling and decor for all life's events birthdays anniversaries weddings showers school and corporate events store openings or just because westchester pop stars takes balloons and shapes them into works of art creating decorative installations for your special occasions no event is too big or too small and their custom personalization service is top notch westchester pop stars is a private studio quickly expanding in-person consultation is by appointment only Send an email to westchesterpopstars at gmail.com for more information or to schedule an appointment. No need to hire an event stylist. All you need is balloons. Currently servicing Westchester, Putnam, New York City, and Connecticut. To find Westchester Pop Stars, search for them on Instagram, Facebook, or Google. The Fade Store presents the Alleged Superstar of the Week Award. All right, boys and girls, you know what time it is. It is time for the Alleged Superstar of the Week. Here's how it goes. We put up a poll on our Twitter account at FadeRouteDNZ, and you vote, and you vote, and you vote, and you vote. And the winner of said vote gets a shout-out on this here show and the coveted ass trophy. Do you know who took home the coveted ass trophy last week, D? No. Randy Rosenberg. That guy. Salud. Good for you. Enjoy AAA, Randy. But that was last week. This is this week. Who are your nominees for Legend Superstar of the Week, D? All right. First up, I've got Iowa star guard Caitlin Clark. Disrespected Raven Johnson on defense by waving off playing defense on her. Teams don't defend Russell Westbrook at the three-point line. Teams didn't defend Rondo beyond the foul line for many years. Nobody waved off defending them. Caitlin Clark, you are my alleged superstar of the week. Number two is Manny Machado. Thrown out of the of the first inning yesterday 
after getting Cole's third strike for not being ready with eight seconds left on the pitch clock in the box. Manny, it's the first inning of the second series. No reason to argue with the ump about this. Just take your bat and go back to the dugout. Ah, Manny Machado, you are my alleged superstar of the week. And last, the Denver Nuggets. Head coach Malone called the Nuggets soft after a 124-103 to blowout loss to the Rockets. The Nuggets are heading to the playoffs, and the Rockets are heading to Cancun next week. <laughs> Can't be losing to games like this. Not to the last place teams. Denver Nuggets, you are my alleged superstars of the week. What do you got, Z? I mean, all great choices. All fantastic choices. Now, we're going to start with Anthony Rendon. Oh. Serving a four-game suspension for grabbing, not only grabbing the shirt of a fan, but then trying to, like, take a swipe at him after he heard the fan call him a bitch. (laughs) Verbatim. You called me a bitch. You called me a bitch. And then he took a swipe at him. Now, yes, while Mr. Rendon may be rabbit-eared, I blame the Oakland A's for this because if you can't fill your your house on opening day where you can't hear the fans, individual fans, that's on you. They're about they're averaging about three thousand people per game. Solid. Solid. I think Astro Little League gets more. I believe Astro Little League has gotten more at a game. But Anthony Rendon, you cannot put your hands on fans. You cannot put your hands on the paying customers. You just can't do it. Anthony Rendon, you are my alleged superstar of the week. P.K. Subban. Oh, P.K. Subban. For your comments regarding pride jerseys and why players shouldn't be activists or be pushed to be activists by political agendas. Meanwhile, P.K. Subban designed a Black History Month hockey sweater for the New Jersey Devils when he played for them. So, we can't push everyone to be an activist, but you're an activist nonetheless. What I don't understand. There's a disconnect there. So, it's either stick up for what you believe in and fight on the side of right or just shut up. It's one or the other. It's either one or the other. So, P.K. Subban, you are my alleged superstar of the week. And last but not least, Apple TV. Apple TV. The MLS package has only sold about 40% of what they anticipated they were going to sell for this new MLS TV package at $12.99 a month. If you're only if you're an Apple TV Plus subscriber, $14.99 if you're not. All the games are on one day a week. Select games will be broadcast on national TV like ESPN and Fox Sports, but you don't have access to your team's home and away game you don't have your traditional broadcasters sometimes you don't have Spanish language and on top of that it's $14.99 a month $14.99 you know what I can get for $14.99 a month I can get ESPN Plus I can get (laughs) I can get (laughs) Peacock and I can get Hulu for around eighteen ninety nine a month. And I can get every major soccer league around the world. Fifteen bucks for your product or twenty bucks for everything else in the world. If you really want to drive fans away, keep doing what you're doing, Apple TV. You're doing a bang up job. Apple TV, you are my alleged superstar of the week. We've said our piece. Go to the Twitter account at FadeRouteDNZ and vote, and vote, and vote, and vote, and for our nominees. 
Just do better, boys. Just do better. Need a little inspiration in the kitchen? Want to try something new? Or maybe you just need a new YouTube cooking show to binge? Well, I have the answer for all three. As You Eat It, hosted by me, Z. I invite you into my home and show you methods designed to empower and inspire you in the kitchen. Cook how you want to cook. Eat how you want to eat. Eat as you eat it. That's As You Eat It, available only on YouTube. AZ, you eat it. Check it out and let's get cooking. Order up! All right, boys and girls, it is time for us to order up. Order up, order up. This week, we're going in a little bit of a different direction. We are ordering up the top five sporting events of all time that we would have liked to have attended if we had a time machine and a ticket. <laughs> From five to one, what do you got, D? All right, don't 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 look at me as a homer. But at number five, I am putting in the 2017 Super Bowl, Patriots versus Falcons. Falcons mm-hmm. blew a 28-3 lead in the third quarter to lose to Tom Brady and the Patriots. I definitely would have wanted to be there the entire game to witness that comeback first. Number four, I'm going with the Miracle on Ice. I believe this was in Lake Placid, New York, upstate Mm -hmm. New York. USA versus the Soviet Union during the medal round of the 1980 Winter Olympics. I mean, do you believe in miracles? To watch that, see that, a lot of American pride there would have been awesome. All right, number three is kind of fun. I would like to have gone to the game three of the 1932 World Series between the New York Yankees and the Chicago Cubs at Wrigley Field. This is the game where Babe Ruth allegedly called his shot. So I'd like to see if he really did. There's disputes Mm. that say he wasn't calling his shot. He was pointing at uh, people that were heckling him. And it would have been cool to be there and see what was what. Um, so number two, I mean, this is a sporting event. I'm going with the Rumble in the Jungle. I'm going with Muhammad Ali versus George Foreman in Africa. That's, and it was Foreman's first loss. Uh, so that's number two for me. And number one is going to be, surprisingly, it's another boxing event. I'm going with Ali Frazier 1, March 8, 1971, Madison Square Garden. Both fighters came into the fight undefeated. Frazier gave Ali his first loss in unanimous decision. Let's see what he got. Those are all great choices. Did we cross over at all? We have one. Oh, uh, I think I know which one it is. <laughs> I, I believe you do as well. <laughs> but I'm definitely going more New York-centric. I'm going to start with Super Bowl 46. Super Bowl 46. You know that one. The undefeated Patriots going in against the Giants. Mm. Yeah, that that's a good one to watch. I don't remember that one too well. <laughs> you know, seeing Tom that... Un- Tom get a ring in that one or no? No, no, they did not. Unfortunately, just shy, just couldn't get it done. You know, the the hubris of we're going to only score 17 points. Yeah. Yeah. Number four. Game six of the 86 World Series. And if I can just quantum leap to one moment, I would quantum leap to the ninth inning. Right? It's like, two outs and 
it just starts going it starts going and starts going and it just if you've seen the Mets documentaries the players saying fuck I'm not gonna be the last out I'm not gonna be the last out and you just see it happening and you see the Red Sox unraveling in real time <laughs> and then move the ball goes through Buckner's legs told me that I would definitely like to have been there to see number three I'm going to have to go with the shot heard around the world, right? You're looking at October 3rd, 1951, playoff game, Dodgers-Giants, Ralph Branca, Bobby Thompson. Were, were there sign stealing going on? Awesome. Did they Did they flash a light with the telescope? Did they raise the blinds Maybe. in center field? Like, I would like to know. Inquiring minds want to know. But just to feel that atmosphere, right? It's a play-in game. It's a winner go home. And it's all because... Ralph Branca only took the mound because... I believe it was him and Carl Hubble in the bullpen. And Carl Hubble bounced the curveball <laughs> when he was warming him up. When he was warming up. And Leo DeRoche was like, Fuck! I don't care. You know, Branca and Bobby Thompson are inextricably intertwined in baseball history. Number two, Game 7, 1994. Rangers, Canucks. When it happened and the 54-year curse is broken, I would have liked to have been there for that. Because it is such an amazing moment in Rangers history, one that has not been replicated since and may not be replicated for a very long time. At this point, we're almost at 30 years, right? It was 54 when they broke it. We're at 30 already. So, it's a special moment. This one moment. will last a lifetime, right? This one, will, this one will have to last a lifetime. Yeah, exactly. Sam Rosen. This one will last a lifetime. It's, you know, it, it holds a special place in my heart because I lost my great aunt the week before. So, like, that is something that, like, united a family in the grieving process. So that that's a pretty cool moment. I wish I could have been there in the garden in person. But you already touched on it. Number one for me is the Miracle on Ice. Like, you have the geopolitical nature of it, right? You have the sports nature of it. You have U.S., Russia. You have this Russian juggernaut of pros against this ragtag group of college kids. Like, that's a Disney movie. That's a Disney movie before they made it into a Disney movie. Literally. (laughs) It's literally a Disney movie before they did it. And to pull it off, like, that's the stuff that dreams are made of. That's the stuff that movies are written about. So, for me, it's a special, it's definitely a special time. And, you know, it's one that we can go back to and we can have a little bit of pride. Because, you know, as as a country, like, we were the underdog. We don't get that feeling very often. We don't we don't get to be the underdog a lot on the geopolitical stage. But for that moment in that time, we were the underdog and we were the plucky guys that could. That's pretty cool. This has been the Fade Route with D and Z. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Catch our podcast on Wednesday night on iHeartRadio, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. So until next time, stay faded, everyone. Time for us to run the go route, but we'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to this episode of our podcast. If you like what you heard and want to hear more, be sure to like and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Rate us five stars. Leave us a review. Turn on subscription notifications and tell your friends. Spread the word. Spread it wide.